medieval blizzard was not just snow. It was wind that never stopped, moisture that crept into walls, and cold that kept stealing heat hour after hour. Tonight, imagine a small medieval house. No electricity, no furnace, no firewood left. The fire burned out before midnight, and outside the storm is only getting stronger. In the modern world, a blizzard knocks out the power, and we complain for a few hours. Back then, one mistake meant your children might not wake up. And yet, medieval families did wake up. They slept through blizzards without firewood, not because they were tougher, but because they understood heat in ways we forgot. They didn't rely on one trick. They used a system walls, ground bodies, clothing, and knowledge working together through the longest nights of winter. So the real question isn't how did they stay comfortable? It's simpler than that. How did medieval families stay alive? When the storm took everything they could burn, warmth didn't begin with fire. It began with choosing a shelter that refused to let the storm inside. Medieval families understood something we rarely think about today. Wind kills faster than cold. A blizzard wasn't just falling snow. It was pressure. Wind hammering walls, ripping heat out of every crack, pulling warmth straight from skin and breath. A weak house didn't just feel cold, it became a trap. So they didn't build tall houses, they built low ones. Stone walls were thick, sometimes three feet deep. Not for strength, but for silence. Thickness slowed wind. Mass absorbed cold. Earth was packed against the outside walls because soil leaked heat far more slowly than open air. Many homes were partially sunken, lowering the living space below ground level, where temperature swings were smaller and more predictable. Doors were narrow, ceilings low, windows tiny or non-existent, not poverty. Physics. Inside space was cramped on purpose. One room, one fire space, one shared pocket of air that could actually stay warm. Heat didn't get lost traveling through hallways or staircases. It stayed where people slept. Children were placed furthest from the door. Adults slept between the cold and the weak bodies, angled to block drafts that slipped inside when the wind shifted. The house wasn't designed to be comfortable. It was designed to survive a storm. Modern homes fight winter with systems. Medieval homes fought it with shape. And it worked. Even in blizzards, these shelters reduced wind exposure so dramatically that interior temperatures stayed survivable long after the fire went out. But there was one enemy no wall could stop, because even the strongest shelter fails. When the cold rises silently from the ground below, the fire died, but the ground was still colder than death. Medieval families knew something most people never learn the easy way. Cold doesn't just fall from the sky. It climbs upward from frozen earth, stealing heat all night long. You could build the strongest shelter in the world, thick walls, no wind, perfect roof, and still lose the night. If you slept directly on the ground, frozen soil acts like a heat sink. Hour by hour, it drains warmth from the body. Muscles stiffen, breathing slows. Sleep turns dangerous without warning. So medieval families refuse to sleep low. Wooden sleeping platforms lifted bodies away from the earth. Even a few inches mattered. Beneath bedding, thick layers of dry straw, were packed deep trapping air in thousands of tiny pockets. That trapped air slowed heat loss the same way modern insulation foam does today. In colder regions, families went further. They compacted dirt floors until they turned rock hard, allowing the earth to absorb warmth during daylight hours and release it slowly through the night. Primitive, only if it hadn't worked for centuries. Beds were shaped not flat, Shallow depressions cradled bodies trapping warm air around the torso instead of letting it spill away. Blankets overlapped not for comfort but to seal heat inside. Children were always placed highest furthest from frozen ground. Adults slept around the edges forming a human barrier that blocked creeping cold before it reached the center. Beds were not furniture. They were survival platforms. They didn't sleep on comfort. They slept on physics. But even the best bed in the world is useless if your own body stops producing heat. Fire wasn't their heater. Their bodies were. Medieval families understood a brutal truth about winter nights. 
Once your core temperature drops too far, no shelter and no bed can save you. Cold wasn't something you fought after lying down. If you climbed into bed cold, you were already losing. So before anyone slept, the entire household prepared the body. Evenings were filled with light-controlled movement, chopping small pieces of wood, cleaning tools, walking slowly inside the shelter. Just enough activity to push warm blood into fingers, toes, and limbs. Not heavy labor. Sweat was dangerous. Sweating soaked clothing and damp fabric pulled heat away faster than bare skin ever could. Too much effort before bed could quietly undo everything else they had prepared. Meals came late close to sleep. Hot soups, thick broths, dense grains, food that burned slowly inside the body, releasing heat over hours instead of minutes. Warm drinks followed not to comfort, but to raise core temperature just enough to carry warmth into the night. No one rushed to bed shivering. Sleep only came when bodies were already warm. Children were watched closely for cold hands or shallow breathing. Elders even more carefully. Families didn't just get ready for bed. They staged heat. This routine repeated night after night, not as tradition, but as survival discipline. Miss it once, and the cold punished you without mercy. Their bedtime routine wasn't comfort. It was thermal strategy. But heat is fragile, especially if clothing traps moisture instead of warmth. Sleeping naked in winter would have killed them. Medieval families didn't believe in cooling down for sleep. They understood something far more important. Moisture was deadlier than cold. Sweat trapped against skin during a freezing night could drain body heat faster than wind. Wet fabric turned clothing into a weapon working against you, so they slept exactly how they lived layered. The innermost layer was soft linen or processed hide worn directly against the skin. Its job wasn't warmth. It was moisture control. The middle layer did the real work. Thick wool trapped air in tiny pockets holding heat close to the body while still breathing enough to prevent sweat buildup. Wool stayed warm even when slightly damp which made it priceless in winter. The outer layer blocked wind. Heavy cloth or hide sealed heat inside and slowed air movement that could strip warmth away. And when night came, they didn't undress. Clothing stayed on. Layers stayed intact. Because stripping down meant starting the night cold, and cold was dangerous. Children were wrapped in more layers than adults. Elders were given the best wool in the household saved specifically for nights like these. They didn't change clothes for bed. They armored themselves. But when the cold cut through everything, they went one step further. Clothing protects the body. Fat protects the skin. Medieval families knew that no matter how many layers you wore, wind always found a way in, through seams, through cuffs, across exposed skin. And when cold air hit bare flesh, especially the face, hands, and neck heat vanished fast so they protected the skin itself. Animal fat was rubbed directly onto exposed areas. Rendered tallow created a thin waterproof barrier that blocked wind while trapping a layer of warm air against the skin. It didn't feel comfortable, but it worked. Ash from the hearth was sometimes mixed into the fat, creating a paste that stayed in place longer. Fine ash particles reduced airflow across the skin, while the fat beneath prevented moisture from stripping heat away. This combination turned skin into a sealed surface instead of a heat leak. Leather took the system further. Strips of softened hide were wrapped around wrists, ankles, and necks, places where blood vessels run close to the surface and heat escapes fastest. These wraps didn't add warmth. They prevented loss. Children were coated most carefully. Their smaller bodies lost heat faster and needed every advantage. Elders were checked throughout the night. Cold skin meant danger, and danger demanded action. This wasn't superstition. It wasn't tradition for tradition's sake. This wasn't primitive. It was chemistry. And yet, some bodies still couldn't survive alone. Medieval families didn't survive blizzards because they had fire. They survived because they understood heat. They built shelters that broke the wind. They lifted their bodies off frozen ground. 
They turned food movement clothing and even skin into part of a single system. Nothing worked alone and nothing was wasted. Today, we trust machines to do that thinking for us. Thermostats, furnaces, fuel lines. When they fail, we feel helpless cold waiting for something to turn back on. Medieval families had no switch to flip, so they learned instead. And when the storm howled outside when the fire died, when the night stretched long and dangerous knowledge stayed warm, 